That was fun. What a fun thing. Well, we're continuing in our series here that we're calling House Plans. How do we build something that will last? And, you know, we, we started unfolding this, and even that term house, we looking at that Greek word oikos, it's a New Testament word for house or household or family or everything that that represents. So how do we build a, a household? How do we build a family? How do we build our individual lives for something that will last and something that is meaningful? And we started with just talking about the blueprints. Whose plans are you going to follow? What set of blueprints are you going to follow to build a meaningful family, to build a meaningful life? The world has an idea of what success is. And, and the culture around us is not shy about telling you what they think you need to be about and what is good and what's acceptable and what you build on. But there's, well, that, it doesn't work. It's proven not to work. There's another set of plans. Follow God's plan. We follow God's heart for us as we build our lives, as we build our families, as we build our oikos. We looked last week at foundations. If you're building anything, you've got to start with a good foundation. You can make it look pretty, but you can't make it last if you don't have a solid foundation. And I love that, that quote, that line from my friend Chuck, if the salvation, if, no, if the foundation is sound, the rest can be fixed. We start with a good foundation, we can, we can address anything. But we can't address the problems unless we go back and we address the foundation. So we start with the foundation. And that foundation simply is who is God? What is our fundamental assumption of who God is? And then once we wrestle with that, then we can come to what has he done? Who is God? And then what has he done? And what is true about us as a result of that? And then we can go to that fourth question, what should we do? Then we can start building on that. Today, I want to talk about framing for for strength and character. Framing for strength and character. Now, you know, it wasn't intended, but it, it's a delightful coincidence, a happy accident, that across the alley here, we're finally getting going on our youth ministry building. I don't know if you've noticed that. It, it, as you leave today, just go back down the back of the parking lot and drive by and see. They've got some framing up. It was delightful to watch them do the framing. Last week, um, the, the foundation was in, but last week they started putting the seal plates down on the foundation, just started building on the foundation. This week, they started building the walls. They started framing walls. And I thought, wow, that's a great coincidence because we have a living illustration right out our window, right out my back window. So I went down and I talked to the crew and just thanked them for doing that and being on target with us and, and let them know that we're going to wrap up our series in two weeks. And if they could be done in two weeks, that would be great. They said they'd try. We want to talk about framing today. Framing the walls. You know, when we start framing the walls, in a, in a building program, when the walls start going up, you start to get a real good sense of what that building is going to be like. You, you, you can begin to see it and anticipate it and enjoy it. The plans, well, that anticipates, and the foundation prepares. But when you start framing, you start to see the character. You start to see the shape. You start to see the function of the building, and the excitement grows. You know, we, we want to talk about that in, in this this idea of, of framing walls. You know, when in a building program, there are two kinds of walls that get framed up. You know this. First is the, the load-bearing walls. These are walls that have to uh, hold the roof on. These are walls that hold up the second story. These are the load-bearing walls, and they are framed up for strength. They are structural walls. And then there's another type of wall inside the building, we, the interior walls. There are load-bearing walls and the interior walls. And in some respect, those interior walls are, they, they kind of help determine what the function of the house is going to be, what the function of the room is going to be. 
And in some respects, it kind of speaks to the character, what, what it's going to look like inside. Is it going to just be square and boxy and, you know, pretty plain? Or is it going to be elaborate? Is it going to be soaring, vaulting ceilings? You know, so those interior walls begin to define how the rooms are going to be used. Well, if we follow that with our series and our sermon illustrations, we, we realize that these walls, spiritually speaking, speak of the standards, the boundaries, the barriers, the things that, that shape our lives individually, that shape our families, that shape our household. These, these are the barriers. And there are two types of barriers. There are two types of boundaries that we need to have in place according to God's plan to enjoy a successful family or to, to have a life that is meaningful, that, that is built to last. There are the load-bearing walls. And in our analogy, we would liken those load-bearing walls to the immutable standards of God. These are the laws, these are the commandments, these are the standards that carry the weight for us. And they're unchanging. We don't yield with those, and we don't tamper with those, and we don't try to adjust those. These are the immutable standards of God. But then at the same time, then there's some interior walls that we put up. And those are the walls that give shape to our family. Those are the walls that help us function. And where the load-bearing walls would be, we would call them the immutable standards of God. Maybe the interior walls we call the, the standards of the family or the family standards. Family rules. Family dynamics. And both of those walls that just serve to give strength and character to who we are. We want to look at both of those briefly this morning. I want to look at a passage of scripture that may be familiar to you. Um, when we start quoting it, people say, yeah, we know that verse. We've got that on the wall of our house. This is from Joshua in chapter 24. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. You know your Bibles made up of 66 individual books, right? Divided into two halves, the Old Testament from the beginning up just before the time of Christ, and then the New Testament, which is the time of Christ, it's Jesus, until the time of the end. These individual books arranged in order, and the first books in the Old Testament are the books of Moses. It's the history of how it all got started. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then the next book begins this, the history of Israel as they come into the land. It's Joshua. So it's the sixth book, starting from the beginning, Joshua in chapter 24. Let me give you some background and some setting into what we're going to look at, because we're just going to grab one or two verses here out of the whole book. But here's the background. We remember that Moses brought the, the sons, the descendants of Abraham, out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, and, and life was bitter, and they cried out, and God sent that deliverer. It was Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and you know, the whole story of the plagues, and uh, finally Pharaoh and the Egyptians were convinced, they let the Israelites go, they came to the Red Sea, God parted the waters, the Red Sea. God brought them up, by the way, to the border of where he wanted them to go, brought them up to the border of the land that he had promised them, but they didn't have enough faith to cross over. The report was, it's a great land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. There's, there are strong people there. We could never possess that. We could never take that land away from them. And so because of a lack of faith, they got to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they came back to that decision point, and this time they were ready to go across. Moses wasn't allowed to lead them across the Jordan River into the land of promise. That was Joshua's job. So Joshua led them across the Jordan River into the land, and then there was that whole series of, of, of campaigns to take possession of the land that God had promised them. There was a season of, of warfare as they took possession of what God had promised to them. Now, here at the end of that era, Joshua, in, in essence, is giving his farewell address. They've gone through that process of taking possession of the land, and sometimes they did that well, and sometimes they faltered in that. But Joshua comes to this point of just saying, this is it, this is, this is what you need to know. And in that, in that season, 
that farewell address, Joshua gives these final instructions. Chapter 24, we, we read, and it, it, much of it is a review, a rehearsal of their history. That God did this, and God did this, and he brought them up, but they were disobedient, so God had to do this, and they were obedient, so God did this. And just reminding them of all of their history. And then he brings them to this point this decision point. We're in chapter 24, and it's verse 14. It says, because of everything God has done. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Verse 15. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Stop there. Brings him to this point to say, you just need to choose. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? And what's that going to be about? Now, don't get that wrong. This is not Joshua saying, you know, one choice is as good as another. Don't go there. This is not Joshua saying, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're religious, as long as you're faithful to serving something. So just choose one of those options. I'm going to choose this option. It's not what he's saying. What he is saying is simply this, that you need to make a choice, and it's not going to happen by accident. Serving the Lord doesn't happen by accident. You have to make that a purposeful choice in your life. And by the way, the choices that you make have consequences. You've got to choose today who you will serve. And then the follow-up of that that next part. And this is the part that is familiar to many of us. Joshua uh, coming back to that statement. Verse 15. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, here it is, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what he just did there? put up a wall. It was a framing wall. That was a load-bearing wall that he just established. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, just before that, he commands the people to choose. Make a choice. You have to make a choice who you're going to serve. The God who delivered you out of Egypt or the God in whose land you're you're living or the gods that were worshipped back in Egypt. You just have to choose. He, he calls the people to make a choice and then you see what he did? He made the choice for his household. Joshua made the choice. Choose who you're going to serve. But my family, they don't get a choice. We're going to serve the Lord. Joshua set the standard for his family. Now, it's the Old Testament so they didn't use the New Testament word oikos but that's what it is. As for my oikos, as for my household, as for everybody associated with me, here's the standard. We serve the Lord. Now, what's involved in that? What's involved in serving the Lord? It, certainly, it, it's much more than saying we agree to this theological theory of God. It's not just agreeing with some religious philosophy. It says we will serve the Lord. Well, first of all, to serve the Lord, you have to come to this understanding that there is one to whom we must submit. Maybe you write that down. There is one to whom we must submit. There is one who is rightfully Lord. We're going to serve him. To serve him means that we submit to him. In all things, not just when it's convenient. We submit to him. And you, you just realize that this is a statement that there is God. That God is. We have to submit to him. And you realize now how we're, we're building on that foundation. Remember the four basic fundamental questions that we ask? That we come, sometimes call them the fundamental questions. Sometimes call them the four gospel questions. First one is, what is true about God? What is true about God? And there are four assumptions. Quickly, we review those. There's an assumption that there is no God. We call that atheism. There's an assumption that there may or may not be a God, but that God is unknowable, so don't bother. That's agnosticism. There is an assumption 
that says there is a God and it's up to us to decide and define what that God is about. That's deism. Fourth assumption. Your assumption. There is a God who has made himself known. And that revelation is sound. We're going to serve the Lord. This is the assumption that we have to go on. Because if there's no God, then there's nobody to serve. If there's a God who is unknowable, then why bother serving him? If there is a God who is up to us, he's defined by our opinion. We're really not serving God. We're serving ourselves in our opinion. We serve the Lord because God is. There is a God. So what we do is because of who he is. We will serve the Lord because we're convinced that God is. He's the one that we have to submit to. Here's another phrase that we don't always think about when we, we talk about serving the Lord. But to serve the Lord means that our lives are ordered for his pleasure. Think about that for a minute. Our lives are ordered for his pleasure. To do what pleases him. Now, automatically, that sets up this, this conflict. There's an internal conflict going on right here to say, what, yeah, but to please God all the time, that, that, that's hard to do. And what about when it doesn't please me? And it brings us to that, that decision point almost continually. Do I do what is pleasing to God or do I do what is pleasing to me? The, when I serve the Lord, am I willing to set aside what is convenient for me in order to do what delights his heart? pleases him. And so Joshua is setting this standard now. As for me and my house, our lives are ordered to the pleasure of God. We'll submit to him. And we do what pleases him. By the way, you, you know, this really is the essence of what sin is. Do I do what pleases me or do I do what pleases God? Do I follow my own agenda or do I do what God has commanded? In that, have to come to an understanding. There, there's an element of faith in Come to the understanding that his commandments are good. To be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, there has to be that understanding that God's commandments are good. And to understand his commandments are good, there has to be some element of trust there. That when God says, thou shalt not, God knows what he's talking about, and that's a good thing for us. When God says, thou shalt, he knows what he's talking about. And that's what we need to be about because it's good for us. Ultimately, it's beneficial for us. His commandments are good and his commandments aren't burdensome. His commandments aren't to keep us from what is good, even though the world defines it a different way. We have to have an element of trust that God is big enough, wise enough, present enough, loving enough to put us in a direction that is good. So when we set that standard for ourselves and for our family that we will serve the Lord, we have to come from that foundation that serving the Lord is good. This is ultimately the best thing that we can do. Not always easy. And it's not always pleasant in our eyes. But it's always good. You notice that Joshua set that standard for his family. We will serve the Lord. That's the standard. That's the wall. That's the load-bearing wall. What God commands, that's our standard. That's our walls. That's what's going to shape us. But at the same time, as we build our household, our oikos, we've got those standards of God, but also we then put into place the interior walls, the family standards. The family safeguards. This kind of describes how we function. How, how our household is going to function. What's it going to be like? What ensures safety for what us? What helps us to live in harmony with each other? These are the standards of our family. Those are the interior walls. And by the way, the interior walls can look different. My interior walls probably look different than your interior walls. It's true in my house floor plan of my house isn't just like the floor plan of your house, is it? But the floor plan of my house shapes how we live. The floor plan of my household, the interior 
walls and boundaries of my household shapes how my family functions. It might be a little different than your standards, your walls, but they're important. You know, I think about um, these interior walls, these family standards. I, I use this phrase, as we talk about the standards of our family, use this phrase, in our family, we, then you fill in blank. Because this is what our family always does. This is the standard of our family, and, and the whole family knows it. In our, in our family, we do this. Now, I have to admit, as I looked at that phrase this week and tried to answer the question, okay, what was true, what, what is true, what was true in our family growing up, there was actually only one time, only one incident that I can actually remember using that word. And I think my daughters probably know it. In our family, we, Emily, what is it? In our family, we, that was the standard of our family. We ride roller coasters with our hands in the air. In our family, we do that. There were other family standards that maybe not spoken, but understood. And you have them, hopefully, in your family. If you don't have those interior walls, your family is going to be in chaos, by the way. But in, in your family, what would you say? In our family, and we could break that down again into two, um, two categories. One is it, it's the standards that provide for health and safety and harmony in your household. In our family, we say please and thank you. That's just the standard. That's the way we do it. There's no question. In our family, we say please, we say thank you, we work on that. The standard. You have that standard. By the way, you don't have to have all, you should have these standards, but, you know, your standards look different. Your family interior walls look different, but that might be the, an example of that. In our family, we always say please and thank you. In our family, we always do homework before electronics. That's just the standard of the family. That's the rule. We always do it that way. In our family... We always let somebody know where we're going. We don't just wander off. Somebody always has to know where we're going. That's the standard. That's the rule. That's the law in our family. You could take that further and just think about safety and health. You know, you might say, in our family, we just don't do sleepovers. Just for health, for safety, for protection. We just don't do that. That's a standard for our family. And, and, you know, there, there are a lot of different things that we could plug in there, a lot of different things we could finish that statement with. In our family, we always do this or we never do that. And those are the standards for health, safety, harmony. But we also set standards that help shape our relationship with Christ. In our family, we make Sunday a priority. In our family, this is going to be the rule, and, and sometimes we fail on this, but in our family, we're just determined this is going to be, this is the law, this is the rule. We're going to make Sunday a priority. It comes first, because that's important to us. We always, most of the time, we make Sunday a priority. In our family, we could add to that. In our family, we're selective in what we watch. We're selective in what we, we feed into our lives. We're selective in, in, in the type of movies we watch or the kind of music we listen to or even the type of video games we play. In our family, this is our rule. Your family might be different, but here's the rule in our family. It's an interior wall. In our family, we don't use that kind of language. In our family, we pray before meals. In our family, we try to do devotions. You know, it's whatever that standard is, those are the things that help build and shape us to give safety and protection and harmony. And by the way, you know what? Those interior walls, when we insist upon those as a family, when we just set family rules, you know what that does for us? You know what that does for our children? It helps them to understand God's rules, His standards. When we set the standards and say this is the law, maybe not say it that way. This is the standard of our family. We always do that, and we insist upon that. You know what you're doing? You're helping your child understand that God has standards that we always do. Turn that around and say it negatively. A child who has never been made to obey his parents will 
have a really tough time learning how to obey God. A child who has never had to submit his will to somebody else will have a really tough time submitting their will to a Heavenly Father. So it's just part of that training. So in that training, by the way, you train your children to a, a habit of obedience. That this is just what we do. That we obey. And you know how to do that because you follow our rules all the time. Now we follow God's rules. A habit of obedience. You, by the way, when, when back here with Joshua, when he says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How do you think that played out? I think Joshua then went back to his family and, and pleaded with them to serve the Lord or or bribed them to serve the Lord or controlled them into serving the Lord? I don't think so. I think, I think Joshua commanded obedience. This is the story. Here's how we live. Parents, train your child to a habit of obedience. Train your child to a habit of faith and a habit of trust. That really all that you need to know is that you trust me and when I say something, it's good for you. Train your child to a habit of trust. So when Joshua went back to his household and said, we're going to serve the Lord, and they said, why? But why? You see, why? You know what why is in the, in the life of a child? Why is a measured response as to whether or not they want to obey? Is the reward sufficient enough? Is the consequence sufficient enough that I can choose to obey or not? Do I agree with the reason? Train your child to a habit of trust so that they can obey you. You know why? Because that puts us in a position to be obedient to the Lord. Because when God commands, there, there are times when God says, here's why. Often when God instructs his people, it doesn't come with the why. It says, obey first. Then you'll understand. It's the foundation. It's the things that shape our families. It's the shape, thing that gives strength and character to our families. The immutable, load-bearing standards of God's word, and then it's the family standards, health, function, it's an important thing. But it all comes back to this: it's based upon who God is and what He has done. This morning, we want to, uh, in our final minutes, we just want to spend some time here at the Lord's table. I, I could ask our elders to come to the front here. Because this is. This is the response. This is the response to who God is and what he has done. When we come to the Lord's table, I have to say it every time, these elements aren't magical. This little cup of juice, this little piece of bread, this does not make you right before the Lord. But it reminds us of what did. It reminds us of the sacrifice of Christ, Christ that the eternal self-existing God took on human flesh to go to the cross for us that he gave himself, he gave his body for us, he shed his blood for us, and that's what makes us right before our Heavenly Father. And so as we partake of this, we look back at that sacrifice. We say that's the sacrifice. And when we partake of that, it's as if we're saying, this is what I trust, nothing else. I don't trust my goodness, I don't trust my efforts or my sincerity, I trust Christ sacrifice. So we look back, but you know what? At the same time, it's our living response. In essence, when we take that, we're acknowledging that there is God. And we remember what he did for us. And we remember who we are in light of that, that we are redeemed, we are the children of God, and, and we are loved, accepted. And then we can come to that last question. So what should we do? For me, my house will serve the Lord. Let's make that our state.